welcome everyone to a CSPC virtual panel on youth perspectives and on climate change. We have a variety of wonderful experts and uh, youth experts in the field here to talk to us today a little bit about what we can do and where we are going in terms of youth and climate change. So um, to get us started, I would like to introduce Jenna Whale, our moderator for today. So Jenna is a policy advisor with the Canadian Climate Institute with their Indigenous research stream. Wherever possible, Jenna uses a complex human environmental systems approach and believes that this lens can be used when looking for ways to bridge Western and Indigenous climate work. At the University of British Columbia, Okanagan, Jana's research focused on climate resilience in Indigenous communities using a seasonal rounds model. Jana holds a Master's of Science in IGS Sustainability and a BNRS in Honours in Natural Resource Sciences. In 2023, Jana was the recipient of the Anitra Paris Memorial Award for Female Youth Climate Leadership through Clean Energy BC. She also published a report in collaboration with the Yellowhead Institute and was named as an Indigenous trailblazer through diversity and sustainability. In 2024, she was a finalist for the Community Advocate of the Year Award through the Foresight Canada and was selected for a Community Award Emerging Leader through the BC Achievement Foundation. So again, welcome to this uh, CSPC virtual panel that's put on for you today by the uh, events and workshops committee. And later on, if you're interested in getting more involved with CSPC, we'll have some information in case you're interested in volunteering. But for now, I would love to turn this panel over to our moderator, Jenna Whale, who will introduce the rest of our amazing panel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jade. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. <clears throat> so thanks to everyone that took the time to be here today. Uh, welcome to our panel, uh, Youth Perspectives on Climate Change. Canada has a warming rate that is twice that of the global rate. And the goal of net zero 2050 is kind of looming in front of us. So this panel really brings together key figures in the current political as well as academic landscape uh, with up and coming young scholars, activists uh, that are here to discuss potential policy related shifts that can help to move Canada towards its 2050 goal. Uh, uh, North Floral Whale, Cree Métis from near Spirit Wood and Meadow Lake, uh, Cliff Whale, Nibot, Wilson Laxi Gitsan, Luamogodi Wingasan, Ponce Jana Dishnik Kashon, Nanaimo Niwikin, Mr. High Spirit Wood and Meadow Lake, Montami Shinakashu Shared in our camp. So my name is Jana Whale. I am from Gitamak First Nation on my dad's side, and I'm also Cree Métis on my mother's side. I'm currently a policy advisor at the Canadian Climate Institute within our new Indigenous research stream, and I'm going to be your moderator for today for this important panel. Uh, I want to start off first by acknowledging that I'm calling in from the unceded territory of the Nanaimo people in what is now known as Nanaimo on Vancouver Island in British Columbia. While I am an Indigenous person and an Indigenous youth, uh, I'm still an unmanned guest on these lands, so I want to first acknowledge that and acknowledge that this place has been stewarded since time immemorial by the Nanaimo peoples, um, which I am very lucky to live currently on these lands. The place that I live specifically is near the historic village site of Soleh, uh, which was a settlement about 250 people who lived on the sandy beaches in long homes and larger houses. Post contact, this important area has since been paved over and replaced with a parking lot and a shopping mall. So it's important to kind of pay homage to these lands and understand the history here. As I introduce our panel guests, I encourage you to reflect on the places that you now call home and perhaps introduce yourself and share your traditional territory that you're calling in from within the chat. Also, I want to remind you that you can really only interact with the session through the Q&A feature. So if you see a question that you really like during the audience Q&A session, um, please upvote that question and be respectful to all the panelists. So that is the only way that I will be able to know what you would like to hear from. We have a really exciting line of experts um, that are ready to share their insights. So let's get started. Our first panelist is Noor Delassi. Uh, Noor works with the Park Board and City of Vancouver. In addition, Noor is an ambassador for the King's Trust of Canada, where she advocates for the importance of shifting economies towards more sustainable and green careers where people, wildlife, and nature can coexist in harmony with one another. So welcome, Noor. Our second panelist is Dwellen Andari. 
So Swellen is the Senior Manager, Climate Resilience and Youth Mental Health at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, uh, CMHC. She works with the Youth Wellness Hub in Ontario, the YWHO network, the co-design, implement, and scale initiatives that will help to foster psychological and collective well-being for youth in the face of climate and ecological crisis. So welcome, Swellen. Next, we have Joshua Wicks, who is a current member of the Chief Science Advisory Youth Council, the CSAYA, and a recent PhD graduate from the University of Toronto. He now works as a technical program manager at 12, a CO2 transform transformation company working to decarbonize chemicals and aviation fuels. So welcome, Joshua. We also have Araya Nielsen who works as a, who I guess should say, who is a grade 12 student at PDCI, a founding member of the Perth Youth Climate Circle and a strong believer in the power of youth voices. Araya has been advocating for climate since she was 13 and has since organized two climate protests and has volunteered with the Butterfly Way Project. So welcome, Araya. Our final panelist today is Batul Ghulam Hussein, who is a program who is a campaigner, grassroots organizer, and facilitator. She is a senior design campaigner at Stand.Earth, running digital campaigns that demand that banks, pension funds, and banks and pension funds stop funding fossil fuels and put people before profit and extraction. Their work sets at the intersection of climate justice, abolitionist, and anti-racist movements, having worked on campaigns calling for Global Green New Deal housing for all and climate solutions that put people on planet first. So welcome back to all. So to start off, I really want to create some space for each panelist to share their perspective on climate change. So we know historically that youth as well as equity deserving groups have been disproportionately left out of climate conversations. So panelists, you're going to each have about five minutes to touch on and provide your perspectives on the importance of youth involvement in climate. Can we start with you, please, Batul? Yeah, um, I think that the conversation around like youth and climate is a really important one, particularly because young people's voices are like so disproportionately unrecognized and unheard while young people are leaving or are already living with the consequences of climate disaster. And so before I really talk about those intersections, I want to introduce myself and name the lineage that I come from as I come to climate work. So um, as named, like my name is Batul Ghulam Hussain, I use the pronouns she and they, um, and I come from a lineage of Gujarati settlers on Masai and Kukuyu territory in, in what is now Eastern Africa. Um, and I want to name that lineage because I think that um, fundamentally, much of my climate work and much of my movement work is, is fundamentally rooted in ancestral lineage and to say that I come to this work because my people and people and racialized people around the world know acutely what it means to respond to climate disaster or to respond to disaster outright. And so the struggle for climate is, is unlike any other in that we are looking at a global catastrophe at a scale that we cannot witness. And the only people that are gonna have the tools and skills to be able to move us through what the upcoming and impending crisis requires are young people. And young people have the solutions that we're already calling for, solutions like free public transit, solutions like housing for all, solutions like climate resiliency projects, to say that we know that it's not just about stopping fossil fuels from coming out of the ground, though that is an essential demand, and it's not just about cutting emissions in half or cutting emissions to zero by 2050. Like youth climate solutions are fundamentally rooted in saying that we know that the climate crisis is actually a crisis of capitalism, a crisis of white supremacy, a crisis that is fundamentally created by the systems of violence and oppression that have created the political conditions that we live in now that are responsible for what we call the climate crisis. And so that the solutions that then young people are demanding are actually at the scale that the crisis requires. They're systemic solutions, they're broad-based justice solutions to say that every single person in our communities deserves dignity and deserves care and deserves access to a dignified life. And that means that every single person in our community deserves clean water, means that, that we deserve reparations for impacted communities, in particular Indigenous and Black communities who have been living on the forefront of, of 
projects that contaminate their lands, contaminate their water, contaminate communities. And we know there are many examples of that. And young people are fundamentally leading the charge and saying, we actually refuse at this point in 2024 to accept Band-Aid solutions to what we know are systemic problems. We know that carbon offsets are not going to solve this, the crisis that is created by unfettered capitalism, that is created by saying that Indigenous lands and Indigenous people aren't valuable when we know that 80% of the world's biodiversity is stewarded by Indigenous peoples, when we know that Indigenous land management is the only solution to what this crisis has required, and young people are leaving that charge. Young people are, are on the streets, they are marching, they are organizing, and they are fighting um, with everything they have, with everything we have to say that we actually refuse the status quo that condemns some people at the expense of everyone else's comfort. And so what that actually looks like is to say that like we know that in Canada we live in the global north, we know that countries like Canada, the U.S., and the U.K. Have, have contributed disproportionately to the climate crisis, and it means that we need to make sure that Canada pays its fair share. We need to make sure that Canada cuts its emissions to zero by 2030 in order to mean that the rest of the world has a fighting chance. It means that we have to call on countries in the global north like Canada to pay our fair share, to say that we know that climate-impacted communities in the global south are already suffering the impact impacts of the climate crisis, and that young people in the global south have been telling us for decades to say that we know that fundamentally the countries in the north, countries like Canada, need to do our fair share. We need to pay climate damages. We need to cut our emissions faster than anyone else in order to account for historical emission contributions. And we know that those solutions have to be grounded in justice. They have to center the people who have been the most impacted by the systems that we currently exist in in the world as it is to ensure that we actually can create solutions at the scale and speed that we require to make sure that no no one is left behind. And there are so many young people fighting on a myriad of fronts to say that, to say that climate is not an isolated struggle. Climate is connected to economic justice struggles. Climate is connected to migration because we know that more people in the world are going to be climate migrants than anything else. We know that the kinds of, of instability that we see are a result of the fact that people are already living through extreme heat and extreme weather that are caused by climate. We know all of those things. And we know that the solutions that young people are demanding are actually saying we are calling for societal transformation. We're not willing to accept small neoliberal solutions that continue to leave the world as it is when we know that our comrades and our, our community members are dealing with the impacts of climate already. And that's true both in Canada and around the world when we look at the realities of indigenous communities that are fighting pipeline projects on their territories, communities like the Wet'suwet'en, um, communities like Grassy Narrows First Nation, who are fighting for justice with everything they have, and, and they're fundamentally in solidarity with communities around the world, like communities in East Africa that are fighting the East Africa crude oil pipeline, that we know that Canadian um, development and Canadian mining companies play disproportionate roles in the realities of human rights abuses abroad. We know that, and so fundamentally what young people are saying is when we say, that the climate crisis is the crisis of our generation. What we are actually saying is we know that this is a crisis that is a result of economic instability, that is a result of settler colonialism, that is a result of global imperialism, that is a result of the fact that we live in an economic system that has decided that profit is more important than people and that young people are, are refusing to allow the greenwashing or the climate denial to take center stage in a moment where the realities of the world are so clearly laid bare. And when we can see that climate is really one manifestation of the crises that we already live in, but one that will have generational impacts for years to come for life, both for people and for planet. And so that youth have a responsibility and an obligation, but also we see it clearly for what it is. And so what that means is to say that when young people are talking about climate solutions, we're actually talking about justice solutions. And we're calling for a fundamental retransformation of our society in order to uphold the commitments that we have to each other and to life on this planet.
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that virtual. That was very powerful. Uh, next, can we hear from Araya, please? Hi, thank you. I just want to start off by acknowledging that I am on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people in what is now called Perth, and I am very uh, thankful to be able to be on this land right now and appreciated of the people who have stewarded this land for so long. Um, I have, I'm 17, I've grown up with climate change. for our future, but I think also the impact of seeing young folk campaigning and protesting can also be sometimes more compelling and interesting for media campaigns too. Um, and uh, as I know many people in my generation are just deeply concerned about climate change and the effect on our future. And as more of us are eligible to vote, um, I'm really wanting to see our voices take shape in the political landscape um, because we all know this is not going away as much as you kind of see people try to hide it and cover it up with um, greenwashing and so little uh, solutions. Um, but I think a lot of young people are facing up to the fact that uh, if things don't change, we we don't have anything. Like this is the, like, it's getting to the point where climate change is getting to be so big, as Batul said, as like definitely as a justice problem um, as well that there's not gonna be anything left to fight for if we don't work on this problem. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, thank you, Araya. I think that's something that a lot of us can relate to today is, um, you know, for young people, especially just feeling like we've grown up with this problem and we really have. Uh, the next panelist we're gonna hear from is Joshua. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Josh. I'm calling in from uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia. And um, just what, thought I'd give a brief introduction about myself and my background, um, and then provide a few uh, perspectives on climate. Um, I like to call myself a climate tech engineer. Um, so, you know, I started uh, my education uh, studying engineering at the University of Waterloo. Um, I liked problem solving. I liked tack tackling hard challenges uh, with math and science. Um, but, uh, you know, there's so many problems out there uh, and and so many different things that we could tackle. Um, and so uh, by, by happenstance, I, I ended up at an internship uh, at a battery materials company um, where, you know, they're working to improve the energy density of batteries so that our electric vehicles could go further distances and and help um, you know deploy uh, electric vehicles more broadly. Um, so I thought this was really really exciting. Um, and and after my uh, undergraduate uh, degree, I, I wanted to see you know what other kind of um, interesting and you know exciting new technologies do we have out there um, as climate solutions. You know what what are what are the hard to decarbonize uh, sectors of the economy that, you know, we, we've figured out batteries, we've figured out solar panels, it's just a matter of, you know, getting them out there and deploying them, right? Um, but what are the other parts of the economy that are hard to decarbonize? Um, and so I came across the chemical sector um, and fuels. Um, we can't use a battery for everything, right? Uh, airplanes, the battery would just make it way too heavy. And so we need to decarbonize 
um, or defossilize the fuel supply. Um, and so I studied uh, for about four and a half years uh, technologies to convert CO2, uh, you know, uh, our emission that we don't really like, um, into value-added chemicals and fuels. And so rather than extracting fossil fuels and petrochemicals to create the chemicals and uh, products and, and fuels that we use on an everyday basis, um, let's turn it around um, and create sort of a, a circular carbon economy um, with CO2. Um, so since graduating from my PhD, uh, studying that uh, field of research, um, I now work at a startup um, called 12 that is uh, commercializing this type of technology. Um, and I'm responsible for developing company strategy to you know, maximize the carbon reduction benefit from, from our sustainable fuels and uh, while minimizing costs so that we can deploy widely and uh, impactfully. Um, another thing that I'm involved in uh, and that I'm very excited about uh, is I've most recently gotten involved as a member on the Chief Science Advisors Youth Council um, here in Canada. Uh, so Dr. Mona Nimar is our uh, Chief Science Advisor uh, in the Government of Canada. Um, and I, along with uh, about 15 other uh, council members, um, age, ages 18 to 29, uh, distributed across Canada, across scientific disciplines. Um, uh, we, we try our best to reflect the views of youth uh, across various scientific disciplines um, and, and help to provide you know, a, a direct line of communication uh, to, to folks in government. Um, and so, you know, uh, if there are key issues that, uh, that you know, uh, you are uh, impacted by, um, you know, we're definitely there to provide a voice for, for youth um, in that aspect. Um, and just uh, some final thoughts on, um, you know, youth and climate change. Um, what I find uh, for a lot of youth is there's sort of these questions of, how can we provide a positive impact? Um, where do we fit in uh, in the world, and and how can we align? You know, maybe the things that we're good at and and our skill sets. How do we align that with our interests, which might be, um, you know, combating the the climate crisis? Um, I think there's an incredible opportunity right now um, for people of any discipline of any skill set to contribute to climate solutions. Um, you don't need to be a scientist and you don't need to be an engineer to to do that. Um, you know, the reason why I say it's an opportunity is because it's an extremely interdisciplinary problem. Um, you know, I have met folks who have marketing degrees that have transitioned into the climate space because there's a, an opportunity for them to apply, you know, the skill set that they've uniquely developed over years. Um, you know, architecture, the way that we design buildings and cities, um, finance, you know, using a business education to um, support, you know, the up and coming technologies out there, um, community relations, making sure that, you know, local communities are, are protected with the, the emergence of, of new technologies and um, how they are deployed. So um, I think it's important to remember that there's no single solution to mitigating the effects of climate change, but um, there are many uh, climate solutions that together, um, you know, we hope we'll, we'll be able to address the problem. And I think there's an opportunity for everybody to contribute. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny when you were speaking, it reminded me of a teaching I, I got from my elders basically. And the, the moral of the teaching was basically that everybody has a voice and everybody has a role. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and I guess I should call you doctor. So thank you, Dr. Joshua. No um, yeah. So do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, Spolin, you have about five minutes to share. Thank you so much. Uh, honestly, everything has resonated so much uh, with what everyone has shared so far. Um, so I'll build on it. I'm calling today from Toronto to 13. And I uh, work around the intersections of uh, climate change and youth mental health. 
Uh, many of you already mentioned this, but I think it's really important to say that young people in particular actually have a unique position now in relation to the mental and the emotional dimensions uh, of climate change. Young people have contributed the least to the crisis. Um, they are and will be disproportionately impacted by it. And they also have invaluable perspectives to influence action. I personally experienced that when I uh, joined Climate Justice Toronto back in 2019. And this uh, youth social movement was collaborating with other movements like Climate Strikes Canada and Fridays for the Future Canada, which was part of a, of a global uh, movement um, that Greta Thunberg had spearheaded and that, you know, hundreds of thousands of youth around the world were part of. And although the pandemic has slowed down the momentum of the social movement, um, now studies are actually coming up and they're showing that the impact that this movement has had uh, has been quite significant. Uh, we know because of these social movements uh, spearheaded by youth, we we have basically witnessed a permanent shift in debates and in dialogue and negotiating climate negotiations that are happening worldwide. They permanently introduced norms prioritizing um, the duty of care for children, anti-fossil fuel norms, climate justice norms uh, around climate negotiations, including um, the COP28 um, meeting that happened last year in Dubai. And so the power of youth is undeniable, but also what we're learning, and a lot of research is showing up in this moment, is that a lot of young people are experiencing the mental health effects of this crisis. And what that means, and we can, we'll speak about this later on in the panel, but what that means truly is that what is at risk is that the ability of young people to continue to engage in climate solutions to continue to see themselves invested in their future and is actually intrinsically connected with the kinds of mindsets that they have about this future and how their mental health and their own emotional well-being is at play um, when it comes to engaging um, with this issue and we actually know that um, you know, things like eco-anxiety or having feelings about the what's happening in the world is actually a very powerful, positive and constructive response. It means that young people and many others who are having these feelings and connecting to the suffering are actually listening to the fact that we have a big problem in front of us. And so there's nothing wrong with experiencing these feelings. At the same time, we need to be embedding supports for young people, for children, and for anyone really disconnecting to climate action, um, to uh, be able to process and honor their pain. And so then when we are engaging in action, we are not just perpetuating the same kind of exploitative dynamics that ended up uh, perpetuating the crisis in the first place which is also something that I witnessed in social movements. There were so many people, young people showing up from all ages, which was incredibly inspiring. And yet there were no supports, no intergenerational supports um, for anyone to process the feelings and the trauma and, and the effects that this is having, which is only going to lead to burnout. And so this is not something that we can solve overnight. It's probably something that we're gonna to have to live um, with the rest of our lives. And so ensuring that we're prioritizing our own well-being and supporting young people to learn how to do that, how to support their own well-being and the well-being of others is actually crucial in the fight for restoring our relations and, and prioritizing the well-being of the planet. It's all one and the same. And so, um, yeah. I am really honored to be here. Thank you so much. And really, really happy to be part of this panel. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And Bernard is so real. So I appreciate you speaking to that for sure. Uh, Noor, can you please, yeah, offer your comments on the importance of youth involvement in climate? Yes, of course. Thank you, Joanna. Um, Hi everyone, my name is Moore, and I'm happy to join you today from Vancouver. Panelists such as this one um, 
bring it if you can if you can hope that our voices matter our young voices are impactful and capable of initiating change thank you everyone for joining us today and for taking the time to be here i feel privileged and humbled to connect with with you and learn from um, leading young scholars and activists. And thank you, Canadian Science Policy C Center, for providing a platform to engage in such fruitful discussions. I believe that young people cannot remain passive victims in the conversations and policies that are shaping our future in a direction that goes against our visions, dreams, and the positive impact we wish to leave behind. Young people are visionaries, entrepreneurs, and innovators. And through our interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary education, versatile skill sets, and eagerness to preserve our livable climate, we are more than capable of sustaining momentum within the climate crisis. Momentum to find the science and solutions needed to initiate change and act on it. Momentum to accelerate resilience uh, and, and when it comes to climate mitigation and, and adaptation, and momentum to fight for the unheard voices of the biodiversity, wildlife, and natural habitats that we are losing at rates even more alarming than the global warming rates. And as youth and young professionals are the future leaders of tomorrow and the future workforce and the ones who will bear the consequences of the decisions, actions, and inactions of today, including our voices and demands in all the development and implementation phases of climate action planning and our collective goals for 2030 and 2050 and beyond is integral to ensure our adequate empowerment and the equitable transition into more climate resilient communities. Our own future is at stake and yet our voice is not being heard loud enough by the people in power, um, loud enough to cause the intergenerational collaboration and systematic system change that we need if we wish the future generations, your children and grandchildren to have the chance of experiencing the life we take for granted today. As someone who is devoted to studying and working with nature, I have learned that adapting to our changing climate is the most crucial investment of our time. And so I urge the people in power, I hold you, um, I urge you um, to hold space for the younger generations to be the active catalysts of change and to empower us to create the resilient future we want. I urge the people in power to uphold their moral duty and obligation and responsibility to protect our planet for the future generations to come and to implement policies in favor of preserving the intergenerational rights of uh, experiencing life within a livable climate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Noor. I really appreciated your your discussion on you know the impacts that span generations. Um, so that really resonates with me. So thank you for sharing. Uh, I really appreciated everybody's answers. So the next question I'm going to ask is: In your opinion, what are the unique perspectives and strengths? you think that youth bring to the table when it comes to addressing climate change? So for this question, I'm going to kind of open it to somebody and then we're going to just have kind of an open floor so panelists can have a little bit more natural discussion. So uh, you're each going to have about two minutes. So please try to be mindful of that in your answers. And can we start with you, Araya? Yeah, I think um, one of the big things I've noticed when I have discussions with people and just when I've seen uh, my fellow activists is that in a lot of cases, um, young people don't really care about the status quo at this point, um, especially as Batul was touching on um, when she was speaking, is that we're willing to go for the big ideas um, and are just less concerned about um, 
traditional things or say uh sticking with say ec like things that have maybe more economic benefits um and that we're kind of at the point where it's not to go uh, extreme but do or die and i think one of the things that youth and young people bring especially is that we like we'll go all out with our ideas and big or go home um and while not all of those may be like necessarily i don't want to say not impossible but like realistic to implicate especially like in timelines i think they they can be done um but i think that's where intergenerational pairing up can be especially important um where we can have the i think you know the typical boldness of youth um teaming up with uh people who definitely understand the system more i know that's something i am definitely looking to learn more about as a 17 year old um which is why it's so great to work with a science policy uh center here um but yeah i think one of the really great things youth bring is just kind of boldness Yeah, absolutely. I love that answer. Does any the other panelists have anything they'd like to add or share? I can go next. Um, Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think Araya touched on it beautifully and like, I think, yeah, there's something absolutely about like youth having visionary solutions and like, yeah, laying, seeing, seeing crisis very clearly um, in a way that makes bold visionary demands possible. But I also think there's a second part about political power is to say that young people have extraordinary political power and we are told that we don't constantly, but the reality is we do. Like the youth vote is fundamentally transformative in federal, municipal and provincial elections, but also young people have been and fundamentally have in the last five years changed the conversation on climate. Um, we went from youth organizing climate strikes to Trudeau walking in one. And I think if that isn't a demonstration of the ways in which young people have moved the Overton window and already changed the political conditions under which we talk about climate, um, there are such clear examples. And you see that. So today, um, right now, the CEOs of Canada's major banks are testifying in front of parliament about the greenwashing that they are doing um, in banks. And that is possible because of young people having built power and mobilized and organized consistently for two years to say that we know that banks are funding fossil fuels at an unprecedented rate. We know that Canadian banks specifically are doing that work and young people have made that possible. Young people are forcing political leaders to take a serious Seriously, we're saying we actually refuse to allow business as usual to continue. And you've seen that so disproportionately in the last five years. The young people have always organized and we are building off of legacies and lineage of people who have come before us and adapting the skills and tactics that they have taught to apply to this moment. And so like I think there is something really integral to say that young people are powerful. Young people have the capacity to shape their workplaces, to shape our like political electoral conditions, to shape the status of movements and young people are involved and they're already doing that work. Young people are organizing their workplaces to build in climate demands into, into bargaining, um, into workplace bargaining. Young people are forcing financial institutions to divest, right? Even thinking about the like transformative wins that have happened in Toronto, um, where like in 2021, 
youth, students at the University of Toronto, of course, the University to Divest, like we are seeing the ways in which young people are refusing to allow institutions to greenwash, to allow business as usual to continue and to say that actually we know that we have political power. We know that we have power to shape the world that we want and we're exercising that power. And the like real problem is not that young people don't have power, it's that people, other people don't believe that youth are powerful and that youth have work to bring to the table, but visionary demands and skills and strategies that are untested. And you can see that across the board. And young people are also adapting to the conditions that we live in. You can see that with the ways in which organizing and campaigning has shifted as a result of social media. You can see that with the kinds of innovative digital tactics that are being tried constantly that are aimed at both federal and corporate targets in order to, to build in climate demands that that we are we are transforming the conditions under which we live right now and when we talk about young people and the power that they have we actually have to recognize that they're already using it and what we need to do is continue to uplift and support young people as they do the work that they are doing in their communities um instead of just like talking about the role that young people can play. We actually need to provide infrastructural and resourcing support to them as they like work to change the conditions that they live in. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Batul. Yeah, and just to quickly support what Batul was saying, um, that's just like those uh, 15 youth who are currently suing the Canadian government right now, um, just doing that incredible work and the fact that their uh, case was uh, turned down, I believe in 2019, and that they appealed it. And then in January it was overturned or yeah, the it was overturned that they've got that opened again, showing the, um, the shifting uh, political climate on, <laughs> on the climate. Um, I think it was really incredible and the power that youth have just to do something like that and that they've already seen um, that those cases can be successful in a couple of states. I believe uh, youth were successful in suing the state of Montana um, and a few others. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Joshua? Yeah, I, just on the topic of, you know, boldness, um, the power that the youth have you know, one one way that I like to think about it is um, there's sort of two type, two main types of change, right? There's iterative change that you know, little by little, lit by little, things get a little bit better, um, and then there's step change where you know you, you take a bold bet and and you have a, a big impact, right? And and I think that the youth are are the best suited for those big bets and the the bold impacts, um, and uh, and just. I guess anecdotally, um, when we think about the IEA, the International Energy uh, Agency, um, when they put out their net zero by 2050 roadmap, you know, this is how the world is, you know, broadly, broad strokes going to eventually get to net zero by 2050. Um, you know, hidden in the fine print is there's a, a section of you know, technologies that are under development that we're relying on to, to get there by 2050, right? So who's going to develop those technologies? It's it's the youth, right? So there, there's a, a, a hidden, um, you know, they're depending on us. So um, yeah, it's up to us to, to take on that, uh, that challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for all of the, the sharing and reflection for that first question. Uh, the next question that I have is, you know, how young do you think, you know, we talked a little bit, I think most panelists touched on it, is how young do you think things like eco-anxiety starts and what kind of impact does it have on, on children? And, you know, in addition to that, what are some of the ways that our system can support youth uh, mental health and agency in the face of climate change? Uh, can you start us off, please, Colin? Yeah, definitely. Um, so... Most studies that are coming out right now focus on, on young people ages 16 to 25, but there are some that indicate that children as young as 11 uh, can be experiencing the mental health impacts of climate change, whether that be uh, you know, eco-anxiety or eco-grief um, or even just fear uh, about the future. And so 
the kinds of uh, evidence that we're seeing um, around the world and in Canada in particular, um, it's quite concerning. Uh, a survey that came out uh, last year for young people ages 16 to 25 showed that it, in the survey it was for a thousand uh, Canadian youths. Amongst them, the majority, 78% said that climate change affects their overall mental health and 73% reported that the future is frightening because of climate change. And what that really tells us is that actually um, young people are and children are entering this, this phase of life um, with an existential crisis. And so, and I, I can speak a little bit more to that and, and the, the concerns that that might have to, to mental health. And, and I would say that there's a lot to say around that, but in a nutshell, when it comes to understanding how young people are are forming mindsets about in, in, in children as well, how they're forming mindsets about their future, that actively is going to impact the kinds of stories that they're going to be telling themselves and others about what this future is, and that in turn is going to is going to affect the kinds of decisions and the actions that they take. And so when we are telling stories of hopelessness and despair, and when, when we see that this kind of anxiety is arising, but no one's responding, because this anxiety, eco-anxiety is actually, we're seeing too, that it's correlated to government inaction. And in fact, in government active action against um, the protection of our ecosystems. And so this kind of dissonance will continue to perpetuate distrust in young people and children and the systems that are meant to actually protect them. So when it comes to what kind of things we could be like we could be doing at a systems level to support the well-being of children and youth of the society, um, there's many things that we can be doing. Um, at first glance, we should be actually leveraging the kinds of infrastructures, the social infrastructures that already exist, like that intersect with the lives of children and youth. So schools, camps, uh, social and health services, and actually be integrating into this in, into these infrastructures uh, all kinds of new partnerships that allow children and youth to connect and to understand the importance of revitalizing our connection to land, to land-based healing, to land-based education, to the links between that and our commitments to truth and reconciliation, to actually um, fund more initiatives that, that amplify um, indigenous knowledge and, and, um, and wisdom into how we're actually uh, educating uh, children and youth around the impacts of climate change and also the kinds of solutions that we need to be developing. And part of the kinds of solutions we also can be embedding into these infrastructures around health and education is connecting young people to meaningful climate action, but ensuring that they are emotionally supported. In, in, in doing so, and that we can also promote hope and more than anything, a sense of active hope. So what that means is truly like think about not only hope that it's not really that hope that someone else is gonna solve this problem, but rather that we all have in, in each and one of us uh, a role to play in, in building the desired future uh, that we that we are. But in order to imagine this future, we actually need to be creating opportunities in the system for dialogue and conversations to challenge this crisis of our imagination. So young people can actually see that even though the status quo is telling us in the present that our systems are collapsing and we're absolutely not going to respond at the speed and scale that is required, actually there are so there's another story. And there's a story where there are many people, including everyone in this panel and many others that we, including young people that we that we meet in our lives and adults who are actively trying to build this other world. And so creating, um, you know, spaces for storytelling are really, really important and, and also using art as a way of mobilizing this picture of the new future as I think it's also an important um, path. Um, so yeah, I, um, I will leave it at that. See if other people want to chime in and if not, I can add more as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Colin. Um, I really liked what you said about, you know, these actions and, you know, the sense of agency that really helps people 
to, to kind of take back control over their eco anxiety. I think for me, that really resonates. Um, I wanted to remind folks uh, who are listening to the webinar, if you do have questions, please remember to submit them in the Q&A for later in kind of the run of show. Um, but I'd want to open it back up to other panelists. We have a couple of minutes left for this question. Does anyone want to add anything to what Solon already shared? Yeah, um, so the biggest kind of work that I did with my youth climate circle is that we ran workshops in grade five and six classrooms to address eco anxiety and uh, attainable action that they could take. Um, because when talking with the other members of the group, we found that this was kind of the age when we started really worrying about this stuff. Um, and the first thing that we did in these workshops was we prompted students to share their, their emotions when they heard the word environment. And it was a little bit heartbreaking to see that the majority of the words were words like sad and worried and angry, um, which is exactly like Swellen was saying with what those studies are talking about. These are kids that are like at least 10 and 11 years old um, being very aware of the problems we're facing. And unfortunately, I feel like one of the biggest issues is that they aren't provided with the tools to cope with this. Um, I know from personal experience when I was that age, um, it was talked about first kind of in my grade six classroom when I was 11 years old. And it was talked about as, yep, the Arctic is melting, polar bears are losing their homes, sea levels are rising um, at a rapid pace and not a lot is happening to stop that. That was honestly the majority of it. And to my 11 year old self, that was terrifying. I was like, what? No more beaches? Um, and I randomly at my grandma's table had a severe panic attack before even knowing what a panic attack was. And that happened multiple times because we weren't provided with tools to understand this type of thing or that mental health was a thing, um, which I feel like has gotten a lot better in the past five, six years, um, which I'm super happy about. Um, but yeah, and I feel like what really needs to happen is that we need to start integrating mental health and eco-anxiety into the curriculum um, on a provincial and because I know curriculums are provincial. I'm not sure if other people have had experience with that in other provinces. I know I'm in Ontario. Um, or otherwise that burnout is going to start happening before we can do anything about it. Um, which is why we really try to start providing uh, the classes we went to with a toolkit. Um, because it was just really concerning to see kids that young feeling like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's even something that, you know, parents can relate to. I've heard to some, you know, parents sending their kids to school and feeling like they don't know how to support their kids, but they're coming home with this big complex feeling. So I really appreciate you speaking to that, uh, Araya. Um, okay, so the next question that I do have is, you know, what are some of the barriers and challenges that, you know, deter young professionals from coming into advancing climate action within their communities? Um, Mara, can you start us off? Sorry, did you say, did you mention my name? Yes, please. If you'd like Sounds to start with that, that'd be great. Yes, I, I'd be happy to share my thoughts on this question. Um, young professionals joining the workforce strive to take part in and contribute to a greener economy and more sustainable job markets. However, following graduation, we are often disappointed and frustrated by how difficult it is to implement the sustainable alternatives that we learn about um, at our programs in the classrooms in the real world. Um, a world which is fueled by fossil fuels and driven by maximizing economic profits. 
our vision of what a prosperous future looks like is quite different from your vision. We dream of a healthy planet where our economies are built to serve life and to protect it against the depletion of its natural assets. Whereas your vision of a prosperous future is one of infinite wealth and economic growth that is oblivious to the reality that resources are finite and to the fact that it's a basic human right to equitably share these resources across current and future generations, but not only among humans, but across all forms of life. All forms of life have intrinsic values and rights to live and exist and coexist with us and um, thrive within a livable climate. For instance, I became a certified arborist and an urban forester because of my love for trees and nature. I wanted to learn how to protect trees in urban areas and how to reach a balance where urban infrastructure and natural habitats can grow and coexist in harmony with one another. However, um, working for the private development and environmental consulting sectors did not help me reach that balance as the value of development almost always supersedes the value of trees. Rather than protecting most trees from development, I found myself removing more trees for the sake of development. Realizing that um, even like realizing that our green sectors are not as green as they should be and as they market themselves as was the main factor that encouraged me to take a leap of faith and to transition from the private to the public sector. Um, in, hope, in hopes that um, public sectors would enable me with more power to fight for tree protection. Um, we are so frustrated at how the system works and how little of an impact one young employee can have in a world dominated by inequitable standards that uh, go against our values and the professional standards we wish to uphold. Young people all over the world, we are carrying a huge burden on our shoulders and in our hearts as we helplessly face the unforeseeable outcomes of unsustainable economies and the repercussions of business as usual. We face so many barriers and disadvantages, but for us, these serve as the driving fuel that ignites the spark of change within us, a, a challenge to devote our present to change our future. And when our young voices unite, they grow stronger and louder, and we need the people in power to start actively listening to us and to save us seats on the tables of power policy making and change. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that answer, Lior. Um, I want to open up to other panelists. I saw you nodding, the tool. I'm going to call you out a little bit. Can I hear from your, your perspective on this one? Yeah. Um, can you repeat the question just where is it around like youth barriers? Yeah, it's youth barriers. Well, I mean, I think there's a couple of barriers like in, in truth, um, my journey to climate organizing was like a really deeply reluctant one. Um, and part of that is that I grew up in a Miskwichiwa sky again in what is colonially known as Edmonton, um, four hours south of the Alberta Tar Sands on Treaty 6 territory. Um, and like my whole life, I like had friends and family work in the industry um, and like experience both the harms and benefits that like um, the tar sands like just played a really massive and major role in in many Albertans' lives, um, and the conversation around climate. Um, and I think that this has rapidly changed when like I was first coming to it was a conversation around individual consumption and recycling, um, and like as a racialized person, 
for me, the fight around climate is intensely a personal one. It is to say that like the island that my mom grew up on is experiencing the devastating impacts of sea level rise. That when I think about climate, I'm thinking about what, what it means for, for my people to lose their homelands, for what it means for um, generations of lineage to be erased. And that is happening at like remarkable scales around the world from um, Bangladesh to India to um, Eastern Africa, and we're already experiencing that. And for a long time, the conversation was about how do we reduce individual consumption when the reality is, is that my individual consumption habits aren't the problem. We live in a, in a system that is fundamentally designed so that corporations can squeeze every drop of profit out um, that like when I think about the fact, so um, like as mentioned before, I work at First Stand to Earth and we run a campaign targeting the Royal Bank of Canada's financing of fossil fuels. And like when I think about the fact that the RBC has financed 258 billion US dollars since the Paris Climate Agreement was signed in 2016, and I compare that to my own recycling footprint, it's not even a drop in the barrel. And so I think that when I think about the barriers that exist, actually, like when we say that young people are calling for bold and visionary solutions, what we're actually saying is we refuse to accept small scale interpretations to what we know is actually a large and systemic problem, that we know that things like banks telling us that they're climate friendly all of a sudden, or doing sustainable investments, that we know that the Canadian government promising a carbon tax while they approve pipe are not actually the solutions that you, you promise them, and that we know that you're lying to us. And so when I think about the like barriers when it comes to actually um, youth feeling like they have the capacity to organize in their communities and mobilize in their communities. It's actually about saying, do our demands fit the scale and size of the crisis that we are dealing with? Because I don't know about you, if I'm thinking about my own eco-anxiety and I'm thinking about the own, like, like what it means for me if I think too hard about the fact that, yeah, the island my mom grew up on is, is going to be underwater. That the idea of getting involved in a community recycling project doesn't fit that need. The idea of calling on the Canadian government alongside other settler governments to pay our fair share, to pay climate damages to the communities that are on the front lines of those projects does. To say that we know that Canada has debt to pay, that we know that Canada owes reparations to Indigenous communities on these lands. Lands, that we know that Canada owes reparations to Black communities on these lands as a result of generational exploitation. And so when I think about the barriers, it's actually about saying, like, do our demands fit the scale of the problem that we are dealing with? Do our demands make sure that we are leaving no one behind? Do our demands actually as usual of our society as it currently exists? Because I don't know about y'all, but like, I'm not interested in green capitalism. I'm not interested in people like me getting to live comfortably in exchange for knowing that millions of people in the global south will die because our government refuses to take action because we refuse to disrupt the comforts of our daily lives in service of one another. And so when I think about the only antidote to that is collective action, but it's also a real fundamental belief to say that we have to believe that our lives are just as important as other people who are living on the front lines of climate crisis. We have to actually be prepared in the global north to take risk and escalate and say, we actually won't let fossil fuel companies, we won't let extraction companies, we won't let mining companies continue business as usual on the on like while we know that our collective futures are at risk. And so the barriers that exist are really about, are you making sure that you are leaving no one behind? Are you making sure that we are moving at the speed and scale that we require? And are we making sure that we're actually calling for a justice-based transformation and not one that recreates the exact same patterns of rampant capitalism, of white supremacy, of ableism, of queer and transphobia, of saying that we know the systems that have created this and we're not willing to, to recreate them anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, that tool. Um, and that kind of leads really nicely into actually our next question. You know, when we think about who's actually kind of steering the ship or making decisions when we're talking about climate and climate adaptation, climate mitigation, 
uh, mental health supports and all of these big decisions, uh, it really is kind of one demographic making those choices and that's, you know, the older demographic. Um, so, you know, I wanted to hear a little bit about the differences in priorities and values between generations. So in your opinion, how can we bridge the gap between older generations and youth when it comes to understanding and addressing climate change? Uh, Joshua, I'd be curious to hear your perspective on this if you can start us off. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, you know, I think uh, this sort of collaboration uh, across generations um, is incredibly important. Um, when, 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 you know, when you first mentioned this question, I immediately thought about, you know, uh, talking to my aunts and uncles about climate change or, you know, the, the, the older generations that we interact with on a regular basis. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, the decision makers as well as, is another level to that. But, um, you know, I think number one is just, um, continuing to uh, stick to the the facts of climate change and that it is happening and that, um, you know, uh, it's not much, uh, if, if we don't do anything, then, you know, we're out of luck, but um, we, we sort of have to take action. Um, and I think older generations have this unique perspective where they can look, think back to their own childhood and, you know, picture those summers um, in the, 1970s and 1960s and you know think about how different they are with the the climate events that we're seeing and you know the rate of um intense weather events and you know may, maybe they're not always doing that sort of reflection but i think when there's this intergenerational dialogue um i think when they are reminded of that then that could you know um click in their minds um about the the urgency of the situation but um, yeah, I think it, oftentimes it's a, sort of an emotional response that we we feel like we're we're living in it every day, and um, it's it's our future that that's being impacted the most. Um, but uh, yeah, I think just continuing that dialogue and um, you know sticking to the facts of of the the situation is you know the most important thing in that uh, that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. That's huge. Just being able to kind of communicate almost in their own language. Hey, does uh, anyone else want to jump in here and kind of share their thoughts on this uh, this question about kind of bridging between generations here? Yeah, I can, if you, yeah. Thanks. I can jump in. I I think it's critical that we actually create context for young people and adults, um, or children, young people and adults to actually connect and not only find ways of working together, but also in supporting each other. I think that generationally, something that we're seeing, even like in this conversation, we've spoken so much about the power of youth. And yet I also know that there are many young people that find that that power is overbearing. And that to imagine that it's on them to carry out the future of the planet, like that is just a lot. And young people need to know that they are not alone and that part of, the, and also adults need to know that it's not on young people. And so in a way, I think creating really intentional context, like there are examples of projects around the world on intergenerational stories of young people and elders coming together and sharing um, the emotional of the climate crisis and then hearing actually the impact of for older people to hear what it is for youth is incredibly powerful but also the other way around like for young people to know that older folks are also experiencing this impact and that they also have lessons and I mean there is so much psychological maturity that young people are just in need of and that it can only happen with time and support. And I think that there's a key role that I guess we don't necessarily have to create contexts that are rooted around climate action. I think that we can create all kinds of gatherings and opportunities for young people and older people to come together. And, and in, in the case of mental health or, or for emotional and psychological well-being, like that is just one context in which intergenerational folks can come together to build relationships and to actually find ways of supporting one another 
but Tool spoke about the importance of uh, legacy and how we're actually not starting from square one. Like young people are building off of a legacy of that social justice fights um, that preceded us. And there's so many value, like there's so much value in understanding um, how might young people um, have intentional pathways of learning what those fights were like and what gets in the way. Same with burnout, like how, um, what does burnout actually feel like and how can you learn to take care of yourself? And those are things that adults may have more experience around and more knowledge. So, again, uh, meeting the barriers, um, I guess, like, the question is, like, what barriers exist? Um, and I would say that it's, there aren't enough contexts for dialogue that are bringing together young people and adults. And so I just think that we need to create them and, and be creative. Yeah, absolutely. I really like the, you know, what you talked about is that, to me, it sounds like that connecting piece, right, is just creating those opportunities for connections. Uh, Noor, I'd be curious to, uh, to hear what you have to say, and then maybe we'll go to Oria to Oria to wrap this up here. Thank you, Jana. Um, we invest so much of our youthful years in studying and equipping ourselves with the knowledge and skills. We build so many dreams for our future. There is so much that we want to achieve, but we might not have a chance to achieve our dreams because our climate is failing us. Our planet is failing us. We do not wish for our efforts to go in vain. We wish to have the opportunity to utilize what we are learning in our classrooms to rescue our planet. We are big in aspiration and determination, yet we are so young and experienced, and we don't understand how systems work around us. When um, there are more older Canadians leaving the workforce and younger Canadians entering it. We need to establish an iterative process of an effective transition of power and transfer of knowledge and experience among generations. This can be implemented through adequate training programs, not only from the older employees to younger employees, but vice versa as well as we all have a lot of knowledge, um, new ways of doing and innovative science and technologies that we can um, spread and share. I believe the local governments and policymakers should see young professionals as a resourceful asset and an ally that can provide guidance and innovative approaches on how to better strengthen, create, and implement new laws, policies, and regulations that will help us come closer to reaching our 2030 and 2050 net zero goals. Intergenerational collaboration with young professionals who are the future leaders of the economy across all the interdependent industries will give us the power to implement what we are learning um, in our classrooms into the real world. We must reshape the economy and job markets in a direction that is aligned with our um, collective goals and the resilience that we need against our changing climate and failing planet. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Araya, did you want to share? Tesla, your mic off. Yeah, just. Um... Super quick. I think it's also really important when we're talking about these discussions to remember we we're in a difficult time right now. I think we are really in a culture that uh, likes to play a lot with blame. Um, when you look at cancel culture and just very unforgiving, and you look at uh, massive political divides and everything. And I think when we're approaching some of these conversations, how important it is to keep in mind that uh, blame's not going to get us anywhere. That we're already we're already here, and um, as we're looking for the future, like we just really need to look ahead. And that's I think that's something that really goes both ways because I think there's a lot of stereotypes around young people. Um, being I don't want like not not ridiculous but just 
you know, not something to be taken seriously and just out there and, um, you know, rambunctious, wild, doesn't, doesn't know a lot. Um, and, you know, they, they can be blamed for, say, interrupting things and um, not listening or just causing problems and vice versa with just that we're, we're here where we are and it is hard knowing that as a younger generation, it's true. We've had the, due to our limited amount of time on the planet, we've had the smallest impact um, on climate change, but getting mad at each other isn't going to work, which is something I think that uh, in our culture right now is unfortunately really prevalent and so definitely needs to be thought about and very consciously um, not done as we have these conversations between generations. Yeah, absolutely. And just kind of yeah, creating a safe space almost for everybody. Uh, we have time for one more panelist to weigh in. Does anyone want to jump in before we move along? They don't have anything they'd really like to share. I, I had a comment no. about the okay. previous yeah. question, actually. It, I just want to throw sure. it in here before we uh, yeah. jump to the Q&A. Um, you know, it's about barriers uh, for youth. Um, and I think, you know, uh, when it comes to career, um, you know, there are the super large job boards like Indeed and um, LinkedIn. But there's actually been some new uh, websites and job boards coming up um, that are, you know, focused on jobs in the climate sector, um, jobs for climate solutions. So, you know, one of which is called Climate Base um, that I I use to help find my job. So, um, I, I you know, I just th you know, there's new things that are coming out there to kind of hop over some of these barriers that the young people might be facing. Uh, I just wanted to throw that in there uh, before we move to the next section. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I didn't know about that website. I'm going to have to check it out. Uh, but thank you all panelists for your answers and for sharing your knowledge. Um, before we go to the audience Q&A, the STA has some questions for audience folks that will come in the form of a poll. So Jade's going to be launching a demographic poll in the chat. Um, please have a look there and submit your answers to that. But really, now it's time to hear from our audience. If you do have any questions for our panelists, uh, please drop it in the chat or upload any questions that you'd really like to hear answered. Uh, as a reminder, I'm gonna be asking the top rated questions to our panelists and we have about 10 minutes for this section. So if you really wanna hear something, please make sure to drop it in that chat. Uh, we do have one question and it says, with the HLPF happening this July, what action should the UN implement in order to be successful in completing the SDG goals and climate action? How can our youth engage in these global discussions? And I will open the floor to the panelists. Uh, so one one topic that I, I would like to see uh, further discussion on at the um, the UN's high level political forum forum for uh, sustainable development um, is uh, uh, resilient um, uh, design in in you know cities and and buildings um, you know with a lot of adverse uh, climate. Um, events and um, you know Batul mentioned uh, rising sea levels things like that um, you know uh, creating sort of you know policies or funding um, to support the the design of um, resilient systems um, it's sort of a, a focus area that I don't hear too much about um, but but I think it's something important that we need to focus on in order to mitigate what what we're sort of anticipating to to happen with um, the the rising uh, global temperature. So that's one topic that I'd like to see a little bit more of. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really important one. Um, does anyone else want to add anything to this question? Uh, 
I um I'm not sure how much I might answer the question, but I find myself with a lot of these forums and gatherings and like the G7 and the G20 gatherings um, more frustrated than anything else. Um, and I may not have the best uh, grasp on politics, but um, I would just like to see real real action come from them um and i think it would also be helpful if they sort of start making some of these things more accessible to youth i think that would definitely help us to get more involved because um, and I know youth, youth is like a broad spectrum, but if we're talking about, I will say, oh, I'm here representing more teenagers, I'll say, um, but it can be incredibly difficult to understand what's even going on with these, um, big global meetings because they've got a lot of, um, you know, I, I don't have the exact terms for it, but you know, rules and policies that surround them. Um, and I don't think they are very accessible for a lot of people, which makes it really difficult for um, lots of people, but especially young people to be able to engage with the meaning fully. And um, that's supposed to be like a global thing. And I don't think they're really globally accessible. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really important point. I know I, I had the the opportunity last year to attend COP and that was something that really stuck out to me. So thank you for voicing that. Um, did any of the other panelists want to weigh in, especially maybe about the second half of the question there, uh, which is how can youth engage in these global discussions for any strategies to kind of overcome the, the problem that Araya kind of raised? Fatul, can I ask you to answer that one? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I'm going to be honest, is that sometimes I feel I'm, I'm kind of on the same page as Araya in that sometimes I feel kind of cynical about the impact of um, high-level political gatherings, such as, like, yeah, the HPF, and like specifically, I'm thinking about like the experience of many civil society organizations at um, UN climate talks or COPs, right? When you think about the fact that the Canadian government for two years in a row has had fossil fuel lobbyists or um, members of the Canadian delegation being um, high ranking executives from banks that are funding fossil fuels like the Royal Bank of Canada, um, and you see the ways in which like we have a government that loves to tokenize young people and say, well, it's really important to us that young people pr pr participate in political proceedings. But by that, they kind of really mean we really just want young people to say the exact thing that we are hoping they want us to say um, so that we can say that you support us and that we're like upholding the demands of young people. And so I think that it like feels really challenging in thinking. And, and that doesn't mean that young people aren't already intervening in those processes. There are so many brilliant young organizers who are going to COPs, who are going to high level UN forums and trying to say that fundamentally we know the solutions, we know we have very clear demands, we know the kinds of policy shifts that we are asking for. And I sometimes feel cynical about the fact that the deck is so clearly stacked against us in meetings like that, specifically when we can't even acknowledge, right? Like we have yet to see um, a document come out of a cop that says fossil fuels are the problem. And so how can we think about what, like a solution to a climate crisis that is caused by fossil fuels and caused by the realities of 
extraction, how can we even begin to have a conversation about what adaptation, what resiliency, what reparations, what repair looks like? We can't name the problem as it is. And when it's not only that we can't name the problem, it's that corporations have bought and sold governments to ensure that they get to continue to extract every single last drop of oil at our collective expense. Um, and we see that time and time again. And so I think it's I think it's important for young people to participate in that process. I think that that resistance is fundamentally integral and it's not that that work should go unrecognized because I think it's incredibly challenging and like important work. And sometimes I feel a little cynical about like what the role of young people can be knowing how much that deck is stacked against us. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for your honesty. I really appreciate, you know, the the voicing that because I think a lot of young people feel very similar to you. So thank you for putting that into words. We're almost out of time here. We're almost at the end of our panel. So in closing, in about a minute and a half, can I ask each of you, each of our panelists to provide one key takeaway or climate policy recommendation that you'd give to the audience regarding what you shared here today? And um, Noor, can I start with you, please? Yes, thank you, Jana. I believe climate change is the greatest challenge my generation faces. It's a global pandemic that requires global efforts to keep under control. And without intergenerational collaboration across all sectors and industries of the workforce, such efforts will go in vain. I hope that this panel succeeded in planting the seed of awareness and urgency in each and every one of you and ignited a vision and determination within you to start acting now, as your example will initiate a ripple effect and will inspire others to change as well um, for the sake of our climate upon which our livelihood and existence depends. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Noor. Uh, Swellen, can I hear from you and your takeaways? Sure. Um, my main recommendation is actually building upon something that Araya had mentioned earlier, and it's basically to urge the incorporation of um, youth and children mental health um, and the impacts of, of climate change on their mental health in curricula um, well, across the country. And I think that will be fundamental to, because Children and youth spend most of their lives in school when they're not at home or doing extracurricular. So the power of actually having these conversations at school uh, really, really matters. Um, I can go with Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Batul, can I hear from you, please? Yeah, I mean, I think that my main recommendation is to say that, like, Young people have the answers, young people have the skills, young people have the tools, and what they actually need is the resources. Um, and they need the like, they need like older generations to offer material support, whether that's like financial support, infrastructural support, in kind support, um, but also require mentorship to say that like the climate crisis is not different from other crises of other kinds of generational crises. And there are so many people in our community who have already done the work to fight against um, the exact kind of systems that we are up against. And so to get to learn and to get to build and to get to support young people is actually like one of the most integral things that we can do um, in ensuring that we actually have a livable planet. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, Joshua, can I go to you? Yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, I just want to thank uh, CSPC for um, letting me participate in this panel. I think I've learned a lot, um, you know, in the past hour and a half. So I hope that our audience has learned a lot as well. Um, I think my my main recommendation, uh, just to reiterate, you know, some of the things that I mentioned before, um, you know, I think no matter your skill set, uh, there's an opportunity for uh, youth to contribute to um, the, the challenge of climate change. Um, and, and I encourage, um, you know, everyone out there to, you know, find the, the angle, uh, that, that enables you to, um, combine your skill set with, um, your, your interests in, in, uh, climate change. 
Um, and I just want to say that, you know, I'm available as a, as a mentor to anybody out there that's interested in climate tech and, and, you know, how they can, um, you know, weave that, uh, that that uh, thread of you know taking what they know and and applying it and transferring it into into this challenge. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, Araya, would you be able to close us off here on this last question? Yeah, I just hope that if there are any young folks watching, that they um, have been able to feel inspired. Um, or just see what amazing work that um, my fellow panelists are doing and how possible it is for everyone to achieve and um, anyone in older generations that there's so much opportunity for us to support each other and work together. And I encourage anyone to, to reach out and support any initiatives in any way they can because help and community is always appreciated always and there's nothing that's like that you can do that's too little um it's like it's a always going to be a community thing because it affects all of us and i just think it's really important for everyone to take away that like all of us work in such different capacities and all do so much and that everyone else can do the same thing no matter their background just like joshua was saying um so yeah just reach out connect and do what you can no matter what it is yeah and thank you for for sharing that i appreciate that and i, I think it's a really good strong strong message to end on thank you to all of our panelists for sharing you know such valuable insights today and thank you for our audience as well for taking the time to you know create space and listen to young people and youth who are really working to make these changes um, I want to thank all attendees for your interest in this panel as well as your involvement in the 2024 CFPC federal budget symposium uh, as a parting gift to me or moderator it'd be really awesome if you could all respond to the feedback poll that Jade has sent around and Yaxi Newsom for, for listening and have a great rest of your day, everybody who attended. Thank you so much. So a last minute thank you to all of our wonderful panelists who spent uh, an hour and a half sharing their expertise and time with us today. So thank you all. It's been wonderful learning from all of you and really hearing some of these key themes reiterated. So thank you all on behalf of CSPC. And thank you to all of our um, attendees, both live and in the future virtual. And we hope that you've gained something from this panel today. And we hope that you'll continue to connect with CSPC in the future. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day.